the Paul Leslie Interviews. Our special guest is, as some would say, a radio legend. Bob Edwards hosted National Public Radio's Morning Edition for almost 25 years, and before that co-hosted All Things Considered on NPR. For 10 years, his in-depth interviews on his program, The Bob Edwards Show, was broadcast on XM Public Radio from 2004 to September 2014, while a two-hour compilation program, The Bob Edwards Weekend, is heard on public radio stations nationwide. Bob Edwards has won a Peabody Award for Excellence in Broadcasting and the Edward R. Murrow Award for Outstanding Contributions to Public Radio. Bob Edwards is an inductee of the National Radio Hall of Fame. It's a great pleasure to welcome the iconic Bob Edwards. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's a great pleasure. So I think most stories are best from the beginning. What was life like growing up? Well, I had one ambition only, and that was to do what I'm doing today. And nothing got in my way of that. <laughs> I was, was single-minded about it. I, I wanted to be on the radio. I wanted a national audience, and I finally achieved that at the uh, age of 25. But I knew what I wanted to do from the time I was three or four years old, listening to Edward R. Murrow on the radio, my hero. and wanting to do what he did. Why do you suppose that you wanted to be, as it's been said by you a few times, a voice in the box? What is it about it? I don't know. We had this big old radio in the living room, and it's in my living room today. It's the only thing I have from my my parents' era. <laughs> big old Zenith radio. The, you know, in those days, radios were furniture. You put grandma's picture on top of it. You put the vase of flowers on top of it. It, it was this big thing. And the, the the speaker was huge. And the voices that came out of that thing, were, they owned the room. I, I guess I wanted to own the room. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but it was important. Radio was important. And what was said on there was something to be reckoned with. And I wanted to be the guy who told you what just happened today and and how important that was in your life. And then it happened. <laughs> I felt real good about that for 46 years now. You're known for so many of the great interviews that you have done. Could you estimate how many people you have interviewed throughout this career? I would say around 50,000. 50,000 and counting. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what is it you like about doing interviews with people? It is the most intimate thing you can do without having sex, I think. You, you can have a real deep conversation with them and allow them to talk, allow them to bear their souls and tell their stories in depth and not be interrupted and not worry about the clock too much. Particularly in this show that I'm doing now, uh, we have a full hour. So, you know, that they can expand on their stories and feel confident that they're going to be heard and the whole background is going to be revealed and the context. And it's a relaxed, wonderful conversation. It's, it's not really an interview. It's conversation. And... When it's conversation, people are more forthcoming and open and honest, and uh, I think we'll listen to benefits from that. It seems like a lot of the radio world, it's like interviews are getting shorter and shorter, and it's going from a sound bite to like even shorter than that. Why do you think that that's happening? I don't know. My wife does newscasts for NPR, uh, Windsor Johnston, and you know you 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 pick out eight seconds of sound <laughs> to drop into your newscast, or, or even less. You you're really getting the answer to a question, and you're not even hearing the question. That's how I started out. I did newscasts, and you know it serves a purpose of the five minute newscast, which has to cover a lot of stories in a short period of time. 
But it's not compensation. It's not. It's not all that satisfying to do. What I do now is immensely satisfying. Just getting to know a person really, really well and hearing their story and helping them tell their story. Sometimes with questions that are not really questions. Like if if they're really, really revealing and forthcoming, I'll say, "Really?" or "No." <laughs> and that's that's just a signal for them to go on with what they're telling me at that moment. Well, so not really questions. They're just kind of prompters. And people like that. People like that a lot. I think people enjoy coming in and talking to me. And they come back again and again because they know I'll give them the time and the respect and let them tell their stories. In addition to the fact that you're more of a conversational interviewer, what would you say that the Bob Edwards technique is? Uh, listen, I want to hear the story myself. I'm, I'm like the listener. You know, I want to know. And I'm not badgering. I'm not the district attorney, you know, <laughs> inquisitory. I let them relax. I think I get more out of my subjects by making them relaxed and not on edge, not defensive. I think if, uh, if your interview subject is defensive, they're not going to tell you as much. And they're not going to be as forthcoming as they would be if they were totally relaxed. So I relax them. I've had people who thought the, the interview was actually um, small talk, you know, to before the interview. They didn't realize that was the end. <laughs> they said, well, when are we going to start? And no, we were just done. And <laughs> thank you very much. You were great. <laughs> Fascinating. And that's when I know I've done my job. I love those. Well, when are we going to start? No, no, no. You're just done the interview. Thank you. You were great. <laughs> in your book, A Voice in the Box, you talk about the experience of, of doing the book tour. So what is the average listener of the Bob Edwards conversations that you've done throughout the years, the people who've been your fans? What, are, what do you find that those people are like? Well, they're wonderful. And what was nice about working at NPR was that I would go out and meet them. Uh, I would do some kind of fundraising event at a member station once a month. So I would go to a different member station each month. And they would have an event. You know, here, you know, Bob's coming to town. We're having a breakfast. We're having, you know, barbecue with Bob. We're doing whatever. And I would talk to them and hear what they liked and what they didn't like and hear their feedback on the show and what they felt about NPR. And uh, it was a community. People who listen to public radio feel like they're part of a community because, well, one thing, they're giving money. <laughs> they're contributing. They have a, a stake in what they're hearing. And they're, they're supporting them with their dollars. So they, they're invested, literally. And I don't get that in satellite radio because we have no member stations. I can't go out and do an event because there are no stations. The satellite goes directly to your car or to your home radio unit. And there's no station. There's no place to organize a, a get-together. And I miss that. Public radio gave me that. And I enjoyed that a great deal. I loved meeting people and, and having them tell me about the program and their driveway moments. You know, they would pull into the driveway and not get out of their car because they would <laughs> hear the end of the story or the end of the interview or the end of the conversation. And I loved that, loved that. This is terrible. Tell us about one of the more entertaining people that you've talked with. I know there are so many, so I could hardly ask the most entertaining? Oh, uh, that's a wide range. I love talking to Peter Bogdanovich, the director, who does impressions of Hollywood people, and he's really good at that. That was fun. I love hearing people's stories. Uh, I interviewed a couple of guys on the 50th anniversary of D-Day, and their job was to get out of the landing craft, run across the beach under heavy machine gun fire, climb a cliff, and knock out the German guns on top of that cliff. And they survived. 
obviously, to tell me that story 50 years later, and most of their buddies did not. That was not fun, not entertaining, but it was riveting. It was gripping conversation. It was, you know, they were heroes. They were the people who allowed us to be free from Hitler today. Mm. And then there's my favorite conversation of all time with Father Greg Boyle, who is a Jesuit priest in uh, East Los Angeles, who works with gang members and Latino gangs and helps them get out of gangs and get jobs. And this guy is supposed to be saving souls. We don't care about that. He cares about saving lives. And he has 10 doctors volunteering their time to remove tattoos from these gang members and help them get back into mainstream life and get jobs. Father Greg helps him get jobs, and he has several businesses that he has started. And it's called Homeboy Industries. If people want to go online and look this up and contribute, I would urge them to do so. He has a landscaping business, silkscreen business. There's a home home girls cafe for the young women, and this provides jobs for young people. And he's used to speaking in homilies. He's priest. So he has a Sunday sermon. So that's how he tells stories on the air. And so he's perfect radio. And I've, I've done two hours with him and asked maybe five questions in each hour. Hmm. He carries the ball because that's how he talks. He, his stories are the beginning, the middle, and an end. So it's such easy radio, and it's 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 real life. You know, these are people struggling with having to survive potential assassins around them. Not something you and I have to deal with every day. And that's, that's amazing radio to hear those stories and hear. He, he's also very honest. He talks about the, the ones he's been unable to reach and the funerals he's presided over. And it's just amazing, amazing radio. You travel a lot. What area in America have you found the most interesting people? Appalachia. I'm a native of Kentucky. I'm from Louisville, the big town in Kentucky, but not too many miles east of there is Appalachia, where people are just natural storytellers. They're wonderful, and they're totally dependent on the coal industry, which is cruel and... um, dominant and does bad things for them and bad things for all of us. They're blowing up the mountains now to to get to the coal. They don't go down into caves and dig it out anymore. They blow up the mountain, which is horrible for the environment, horrible for the chemicals they use, which they pour into the streams of eastern Kentucky, which flow into the Ohio and down into the Mississippi and just upset the whole eastern U.S. water table. But these people are are great storytellers. They're just natural. And they've got, again, it's great radio. I've done many, many documentaries on eastern Kentucky and the literature of eastern Kentucky, the music, bluegrass music of eastern Kentucky. It's just a culture right in the middle of the country that is rich and, and wonderful radio. I thought you were either going to say Appalachia or, having heard so many of your interviews from New Orleans, I thought it was going to be one of those two. <laughs> <laughs> oh, New Orleans is, is a gift. You just go down there and there's so much music and and so many people, you know, Creoles and Cajuns and it's unlike any other place in America. It's like another country. And, and, and a foreign country within the U.S. border. Uh, and, oh my God, if you can't get a story out of New Orleans, you, you're not even trying. <laughs> <laughs> you just mentioned the music, and you've done so many great interviews with musicians. So many. What musician have you been the most in awe of? I work in a jukebox. I'm sitting here at Sirius XM where we have 80 music channels, and there are musicians here every day. And the very first week I was here, in um, 2004, 
I walked down the hall and saw Peter Paul and Mary. I said, oh my God, let's <laughs> just, you guys just come in here. <laughs> and I had lived being interviewed because I loved them so much. I didn't need any research with them. And it's kind of like that every day. There are so many musicians that come through here. Talking to David Crosby, uh, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, Jackson Brown. You know, I did, to talk to these people and, and go over their careers and what they were like struggling and writing songs and why they wrote this way and not that way and why they chose these notes and not that, you know, why they chose these words and not those lyrics. And I love the creative process. I love to talk, I, I love to talk to writers about that too. How they create, what inspires them, what drives them, why, why must they do this? And they must. They must. I, you know, I wish I had some of that juice myself. My job is to get it out of them and find out why they do what they do and how they do it. And that, that just amazes me that people can do that. And I mean, I don't think you can talk to an athlete and, and have them tell you how they can hit a curveball consistently and drive it deep and hit 40 home runs in here. I don't think they can do that. They just do it. But writers and musicians can tell you how the process goes. And so it's much more interesting. What do you think of the songwriting of Randy Newman? Uh, I love Randy Newman. Randy, Randy has the same sick sense of humor that I do. I'm kind of a cynic about life. He could have been a great journalist. <laughs> And so I, the, I don't know how that interview happens because I just laugh at everything he says. Everything. <laughs> so, so Randy's mumbling away and I'm laughing and I don't know if we have a good interview at all. But the, a guy who can write a song like you can leave your hat on. <laughs> 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 Go listen to that one. And, and you get an idea of he, his narrators the people who are singing his songs, he assumes these identities that would be repugnant in real life, but he's not afraid to be that narrator, like, you know, laughing at short people and making them a, a subject of a song. I mean, Randy's not a bigot, but he is assuming the role that people think in real life. He's not a deviant sex person, but if you listen to You Can Leave Your Hat <laughs> you know that's the narrative. But he writes those songs. But he, you know, he's left all that for movie scores. The Natural and Toy Story. And finally won an Oscar after being nominated, I don't know, 17 or 18 times. <laughs> finally got one. He's just been a, a great composer, and he's the nephew of three other composers who did most of the music for the movies of the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Really? Yeah. Yeah, it's in his blood. There are certain people as an interviewer that are elusive. There are some people, for example, Bill Murray, no publicist. Bob Dylan always been press shy. Who has always eluded you that you wanted to get a hold of? It took me 30 years to get Johnny Cash. Every time I scheduled him, something happened. He would go to the hospital or he would start a tour or something. And I finally got to him just maybe five or six months before his death. And it was a marvelous experience. Oh, my God, he was great. He was just great. In the final months of his life. Down in Nashville, in his home in the woods. I never got to Kurt Vonnegut, and that upset me. Uh, I never got to talk to him. There have been a lot of those. They just, you know, just, just never happened. And I'm really sorry about that. And well, they're gone now. When I came to XM, I purposely said about interviewing people in their 80s and 90s so that I could get them before they died. And last week, we were running those interviews, <laughs> rerunning those interviews. People like Pete Seeger and Studs Terkel 
and it turned out that the first person I interviewed who died was only 55. <laughs> it was Wendy Wasserstein, the playwright. And she was the first XM interview that I had who died. It wasn't one of those 80 or 90 year olds. But yeah, I think it's important to talk to these people and, and get their record on uh, audio. That's why I've donated all these interviews to the Library of Congress because I think they're important records that people will need for research. And there's a source right there at the Library of Congress. You mentioned the late Studs Terkel a moment ago, just a tremendous interviewer. What interviewers of today do you respect the most? Well, let's see. Studs was great because Studs, Studs would go off on tangents. And you would think, oh, my God, this is really old guy who's lost his marbles. <laughs> but Studs would, would take that tangent out 10 minutes or so and remember exactly why he went off on that tangent and come back to the question you asked. And and I, of course, by that time, had forgotten the question I asked. <laughs> but Studs hadn't forgotten. Studs was right there, and he came right back to it and just kind of put the period at the end of the sentence. And what a joy, what a wonderful thing that was. So he was the best. He was the absolute best, and that's why his his oral histories, like working and the good war, are so valuable and important documents that we have forever. Good interviewers today, I don't know, you don't get to to see an interview for very long or hear an interview for very long. Who's the, who's the guy on PBS and CBS and tall, blonde fellow? You know who I'm talking about? Tall, blonde fellow. Yes. Mm. He, he works on, he's got his own show on PBS. It's a long-form interview program. My mother-in-law loves this guy. Blonde, <laughs> blonde hair. Hmm. Yeah. Help me out here. He's on CBS. He does CBS in the morning, and then he has a PBS show on prime time. Hmm. He does a good one. I'm sorry. You know, not, it's not ringing a bell right now. Charlie, Charlie, Charlie. All right, I'm on my computer. Not Charlie Rose. Yeah. Oh, Charlie Rose. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that guy. That's true. Yeah. He does a good interview. Indeed. I've been on his show. Well, what about Terry Gross? What do you think of her? Oh, of course. Of course, Terry Gross. Yes, absolutely. I was on Terry Gross's show when it was still local in Philadelphia. <laughs> That's how old I am. <laughs> yeah, fresh air. Oh, my God, yes. Absolutely. Love Terry. What is next for Bob Edwards? I wish I knew. <laughs> I want there to be a next. I honestly want there to be a next. I you know, would love something in public radio. I would like to go back home to NPR, where I spent 30 wonderful years and a formative time in my career and helped establish that brand. But I don't know what's my crowd that my wife is working in. And I'm very proud of the work she's doing. What is the best thing about being Bob Edwards? The fact that I managed to get three children through college without student loans. <laughs> the greatest accomplishment of my life <laughs> that I managed to pay for three kids to go to college and not have them in debt. And I don't know that that's possible anymore. $30,000 now buys you maybe a semester. Hmm. And I, I, I couldn't do that today. But you know, I could do it when my kids were in school. And I don't know how anyone gets through college now without scholarships. So, you know, it's ridiculous. It's outrageous. It's, it's a national disgrace, the cost of education. And why must that be only for the elite? Why can't working people and you know, working class people and poor people have some access to college? Right? That, it's going to hurt this country. It really is. If that becomes only something the elite can afford. Hmm. What would you say to anyone who's listening in, totally open-ended? Tell me your story. <laughs> I, I love David Isay and fine, long-time public radio producer who does something called StoryCorps. And he has little listening booths all across the country and just 
where people can go in and tell their stuff. I think it's a great idea. It's just it's a genius idea. Because everyone has a story. Everyone has a story. You don't have to be fabulously rich and successful to have a story. That's ridiculous. You know? Everyone has a story. And it, there's something of value there for all of us to hear it, to listen to it. So that's what I would do. I would say, tell me your story. My last question. Who is Bob Edwards? <laughs> Just a guy who wanted to be on the radio and realized his dream and was very happy about that. And wants to continue that dream for as long as, long as I can. Mr. Edwards, thank you very much for sharing with us. Great pleasure. Uh, my pleasure.